All right, guys, it is Tuesday night. We're an hour early for our conversations with Commodores, but partially due to my schedule and the fact our, our man tonight, Brian Kasser, who's our guest, he's out on the West Coast, made it a little easier for us to do this. Brian, thank you for joining us, bud. It's so good to see you. I'm glad to catch up with you for a minute or two, and uh, thank you for making some time tonight. It's a it's a pleasure to reconnect with you, Bernard, considering that you were the first player I met when I walked on the field back in 1986. And, and even with that information, guys, he stayed. He ultimately <laughs> stayed. He played with us for a couple of years. He graduated. Now he's doing awesome things. But we're going to get into, into all of that. Brian, before we jump into the time machine and head back to the roots of your origins, tell folks about what's going on in your life these days, about your family, your work, whatever you want to share about these current times with Brian Kasser. Fantastic. Well, uh, live in Los Altos, California, which is um, about – an hour south of San Francisco. It's right touching the Stanford University campus. Beautiful area here, very woodsy, wonderful nature, great, great activities and sports. Um, my, uh, my wife and I, she was a Vanderbilt grad also, graduated in 1989, and uh, we met at Vanderbilt and got married a few years later. Uh, we, uh, we live here. Our two sons have both flown the coop. They have launched successfully. One lives in Austin. We actually just saw both of them this weekend. Uh, one lives in Austin, work, graduated from SMU and works at uh, VMware. They're doing sales. And the other one is a rising junior at Purdue University. Um, so go Boilermakers. And, um, you know, he's, um, he'll probably get into finance, like something finance related like, I've, like I'm in. I got to ask, you're out in the West Coast, two Vandy grads. How did the boys end up at their respective schools? You know, it, it's interesting. I think one of the greatest lessons I learned and, you know, sometimes you, you kind of back into these lessons in life. It wasn't something that was premeditated. One of the greatest lessons I learned in life is get out of your comfort zone. Do something different. Um, when I grew up here in California, the majority of my classmates, my friends, all went to school in California. They go to uh, the UC system or, you know, one of the other schools. And, and doing something crazy and wild for them was going to Oregon or University of Washington, a state mm -hmm. or two away. Um, going to Vanderbilt opened my eyes to such a different and new and incredibly, you know, wonderful part of the country. And I, I was able to take that with me my whole life, my whole career. When I'm able to go and do business in other states now, in the South or in the Northeast or in the Midwest, you know, a lot of that training was because I didn't think just like a Californian. I actually think like somebody who's, you know, seen most, if not all of the United States. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, that's how we got there. Wow. I mean, this is, you're, you and I are the same age. So we graduated high school in 86, but let's go back to the, the fall of 85, maybe the spring, summer of 85. You're starting to consider colleges. You're a rising a junior to be a senior, but how did Vanderbilt get on your radar as opposed to the Ivies or, or anywhere closer to home? One, one of the best things about growing up, I grew up right next to the Stanford campus. Mm -hmm. um, and seeing Stanford and understanding Stanford and seeing, you know, not only the greatness of the academics there, but also the greatness of the athletics. When I was growing up, that was John Elway. You know, mm -hmm. he was, he was the quarterback there. Yeah. And w the one thing I took away was, and I was playing sport, I was playing football and other sports about five miles South at a school called Menlo school in Menlo park. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I took away was that I didn't think that you had to give up anything to, to, you know, to, to have a great experience mm -hmm. um, that, you know, to have incredible academics, but also have great athletics and a great social life and a great community that you could have it all because you could have it all at Stanford. That's mm -hmm. what it was. Oh, sure. And no knock on any other school. But I think that there are a few schools in the country that for the last 50 years or, or longer, have really defined kind of that greatness in all aspects, like Stanford does. Um, and, you know, I think it's a very small group of schools. I think it's Stanford. I think it's Duke. I think it's Northwestern. Um, and I think it's Vanderbilt. And um, there's a few more in there. I mean, there's some great rising schools. Tulane's, you know, wonderful rising place. SMU's rising. Um, but I, I didn't want to give up anything. And I really, really wanted to play football. But I didn't want to do it at a D3 school, and I didn't want to do it in, do it in the Ivy Leagues. 
And I, if I wasn't good enough to play at Stanford, I was going to go find some other school. So I just went out there and I basically did my own recruiting, you know, journey across the country, knocking on doors at Duke and Vanderbilt, and Northwestern and a bunch of schools like that. And, you know, in the 80s, it's not like we had Internet or anything digital mm. or anything automatic, no cell phones. You really had to fly or get on the phone or, or send tapes. Is that really what you did to those schools? We had big old, big old tapes, yeah. you know, that we, we sent um, that our coach and our coaching staff put together mm -hmm. and they'd write a very nice letter mm -hmm. and they, they'd put these packets in the mail to the coaching staff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that it would, the tape would show what, what the player could do. And of course, you know, it's all the best stuff they did. So it didn't show all the terrible things I did, but right. Right. Um, the tape doesn't tell the whole story. The letter from the coach talks about, you know, coachability, leadership, um, mm -hmm. team orientation, you know, like selflessness or selfishness, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And I think when the coaches read the letters, they'll watch the tape and, and they'll see the tape and they'll see like, you know, I don't know, there's a certain percentage of players that just you see the tape and you're like, oh, my gosh, I have to have that player. Yeah. For the rest of us out there, they'll look at the tape and they'll be like, mm, I'm sure sure he could be a pretty good player but they'll read the letter and they'll really try to understand what is this person going to add to the program are, are they going to be net additive in more ways than just what they do when the whistle you know in between the whistle blowing yeah. and um i think that's important and i mean you know this was you remember we 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 joined the team watson's first year i mean he was putting that team together it was a major transition and his brother was at Tulane and was already having success there. Yep. And Watson had just left Rice, if, I, if I'm correct. Yeah. Um, he had a lot to prove. And he really needed to make sure that there was cohesion on the team. That's exactly right. He came in late into the recruiting season. November, I think, it was when he was introduced. So he only had December, January, and February. And before we keep going, Brian, I want to welcome Gary Veach, Kenny Cole, and David Kropp. Uh, to the show. I've got Brian Kasser. Brian played with us in the falls of 86 and 87. He and I came in the same year. And Brian, what was it that either Watson or somebody on the staff must have taken a shine to you and vice versa to be able to get you to actually come out to, to Nashville? And when did you first visit the campus? So I, I was very, very close to my high school football coach, Ron, Ron Bryant. And, you know, really grew up, we, we were a small school. So we had a lot of success. In fact, our quarterback, um, three years before me, replaced John Elway at Stanford. And oh, so wow. he was, and then our starting receiver, two years before me, went on to Colorado and played on a national championship team as a starting receiver there. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of success for a very small school. Mm -hmm. um, and our coaching staff, the coaching staff and the players, we were very tight. But I think we were all, our, our coach, Ron Bryant, he was also brutally honest too. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of have, I, I should find the letter somewhere. I don't think I ever kept a copy of it, but the letters he wrote to the coaches, like Watson, mm -hmm. very much said that, um, like, like let, let, me, let me be clear, Brian was a very good high school player. Okay. Mm -hmm. He did a lot for this program. You know, he, you know, did wonderful things for the program. Um, I, you know, whether he's going to be an incredible college football player, I don't know. I think he was very honest. He's just like, you know, he, he, you know he's not that big, 5'11", weighed about 200 pounds, not that fast, you know, kind of strong, but not that strong. Um, I, I can't tell you he's going to walk on, on your field and be the greatest player, but I can tell you that this guy will work harder than anyone you, you've, you've seen in a long time, and he will do everything he can in his power to contribute what's necessary for him to contribute to make the team better mm -hmm. both on the field and off the field and i think he wrote that in the letter he's like you can you can i can guarantee you because he remembered me when i was a um when i was a sophomore in high school you know i was just kind of like figuring out football at that point in time but even though I, I got, you know, pretty good junior and senior year, he remembered me as a sophomore because I was willing to do anything. I gave the starting offense 
really good reps in practice. Mm -hmm. You know, when every, I mean, gave them really realistic reps, which is hard to do. You know, that's one of the hardest things to do is to make sure you're starting offense and defense, get yeah. realistic reps in practice. Yeah. Um, yeah. Especially by the second and third team that are kind of like, you know, they're not starting. It's kind of a bummer for them. They got to, you know, you got you to kind of muster it up and really put some effort into it. Yeah. So I think that's what he put in the letter and highlighted. And I think Watson was just that sort of like, hey, listen, I got a spot. Like, it's just one locker. It's not, you know, if if, if this guy surprised me on the upside, awesome. If he doesn't, I'm, I'm not giving up too many slots here, but I'll give this guy a shot. And so he wrote me a letter back and said, come on out here. You, you know, welcome, welcome to the team. Oh, that's fantastic. Now, when did you visit the campus for the first time? I think I visited in, I think it was March and April of the previous year. And it was pretty late in the cycle. I mean, I think Watson was kind of filling out the roster at that point. Mm -hmm. He was in pretty good shape at that point. And I looked at, you know, I, you know, like I said, I looked at Northwestern and Duke and I went and looked at a few D3 schools. I looked at Tufts and Bucknell and a few schools like that. And I got to Vanderbilt and I saw the stadium and walked around the campus and Popped into a couple parties back then. I could get into the parties, right. you know, underage. But um, and it was it was just awesome. I told my dad go back to the hotel. I, I I'm gonna hang out here for a while. Well, that's what I was gonna ask you. Did you take these trips with a parent or a family member, or did you take them on your own? No, my dad. My dad used to. He came with me to all these, you know, trips, and um, he was super supportive. It was interesting because um, he's a retired doctor, mm -hmm. and so you know, even back in the eighties, I mean, now we know football is pretty controversial as a, as a sport in the medical community, even in the eighties, doctors knew like banging her head around like that was not really a great thing. And, um, and I used, I mean, we used to have like this family, it was like a family, like ritual, like every Friday night I'd wind up after a high school game, I'd have to go to the ER and um, get something x-rayed. There was something, there was a problem, either ribs or, hey, this you know, a shoulder. This became a ritual. It was like the ritual. And so <laughs> I get there and the biggest joke at the hospital was like, it's good thing your dad's the doctor because he gets free x-rays. I mean, it was going to get, start to get really expensive. He had to pay for all my x-rays and I was there every single Friday night. So <laughs> He, but he was super supportive. He was just like, you know, he's, he, he was interesting. He's like, he'd look at me, be like, you know, your, your, your head getting hit like that. It's not a good thing. Okay? Right, he goes, right. but he goes, if this is what you want to do, I'm supportive. Like you're going to do the same thing for your sons, you know, yeah. to a point, to a reasonable yeah. point. But he was great. I mean, he just, he flew all over the place with me. And, you know, when I asked him a question, I mean, I think he thought, um, I think he was most concerned about me ever seeing the field if I if I went to a, a D1 school. Like he was, you know, this is me being honest with you, Bernard. Um, he yeah. I think he down deep hoped I would play at Tufts mm -hmm. because it was D3. Mm -hmm. Um, it was not as it was not as intense. I wasn't as undersized as right. as I was in a D1 program like Vanderbilt. He he knew I would probably see the field, you know, a lot more um there and i think he was worried i was just going to vanderbilt because it was d1 and the sec and the you know the lore of it and i had to t just i had to tell him it's that no, no no dad it's the fact that it's got it's the trifecta they've got the academics they got the athletics and they've got the community and i want all three of those things and he and he said like okay as long as you're thinking through it that way i'm supportive well it, it certainly is so true even in, when we were coming through in the in the 80s it did have all of those it still has all of those and so much more but it's a, it's a rarity to go to such an expensive private school and and pay your own way or or whether you have academic money or or whatever but still to walk on it's not like it's a state school it's not like t Tennessee or Alabama where you have tryouts to just be a walk on mm -hmm. We could use all the the warm bodies on the team that we really could. So, Brian, were there ten walk-ons on the team in that in the fall of '86? There were three. There were three. I was going to say three was, was Mike was, Voigt might have been one. Or was oh, it, I'm sorry, four. It was Voigt. So it was um, Andy Tees, Mike yeah. Voigt. One other guy too. I forgot his name. I was trying to think of it beforehand. Yeah, uh, he played rugby afterwards when he stopped playing football, oh, and then it was me. To me, yeah, yeah. But even before that, some of the older guys. I remember Brad. Oh heavens, he was a he was a wide receiver. He ended up going to App State. 
Dwayne, I know that you're, you'll know who it is. Um, and Crop, do you remember some of the walk-ons in, in 86, 87? But, but the point being is, Brian, it, it's, you were really a, a, a rare breed to walk on. Now, do you, did you feel like from the teammates, were you treated any differently? Were you hazed? Were you given a hard time? Or were you wel welcomed with, with arms? Open I, I tell you, I, I mean, this, the football experience at, at Vanderbilt, and, mm -hmm. I'm, and one of the reasons, is, you know, I wanted to do this with you today, Bernard, is mm -hmm. um, like for a guy who, who, you know, wasn't good and, and really never played and, and didn't have any sort of illustrious career whatsoever at Vanderbilt, mm -hmm. my experience there helped define everything I've been able to do the rest of my life. I'm, absolutely. Because one of the greatest lessons you learn in life is what do you do when you're not the top dog? What do you do when you don't get to be in charge and that you have to be a role player and you have to contribute in other ways? And it was amazing for me to learn that at age 19, you know, in a way like going from my high school team where, you know, it was, it was a pretty good situation mm -hmm. to going to, to this team where I had to figure out any way possible to contribute to this team. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what, what was interesting about it was I, I could not ask for more from the teammates, from the coaches. There was never one, like the fact that I think, I think they would have hazed me if I had come out there either with attitude or been lazy. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I, I didn't have any attitude and the fact that I was willing to work harder than anyone in the weight room or practice harder than anyone or give, I remember, you know, you know, I, you know, I don't know if you remember this, like I just volunteered to be Chris Gaines as tackling dummy. Like every drill, I was just like, no, just give me the red shirt. I'll take care of Gaines. And Chris Gaines loved me because I just, he would just demolish me in practice over and over and over again. And it was like, mate, that's if, if I can help in this way, I am so good with this. And you know, guys like Boo Mitchell and, and, um, you know, you know, Carl Woods, people like that. I mean, they were just like, you know, they were so supportive of me because they could see like, you know, no one else was going to be Chris Gaines' tackling dummy. Like, <laughs> no, they weren't. <laughs> no, so, they weren't. I don't want to I mean, say I, that, Brian. What, what my memories of you is you work damn hard in the weight room. And that you would, you would do just about, or you did do just about anything was ever asked of you on and off the field. And I think you're so right. And I didn't mean to cut you off, but I think you're so right that had you come in with some sense of entitlement, like some scholarship guys do, or you felt like, well, why am I not on scholarship? I'm just as good as these guys. I think you, it would have been a whole different experience. I think you embraced it the way that is the best. And it, it obviously it has led to some great memories and created such a foundation for you when we're, you know, we're largely knuckleheads when we're 18, 19 and 20 yeah. and even beyond that. But you had you had some maturity there to recognize that even after. And I don't know, we'll get to this, but not many guys walk on and even fewer who are on the team pledge a fraternity as well. So I don't know when you slept, but clearly you figured out some kind of a schedule. So that's kind of where I want to want to head. I know you you were with us on the team for a couple of seasons, but how did you find your mark within the fraternity and did it overlap your football days? Well, so you can thank the fraternity on Doug Bradley and <laughs> Steve Kasanovich. So they they they're the reason I'm in that fraternity and I was super close for them from the very beginning of playing at at uh, at Vanderbilt um and wait Brian, I, these are two guys out of Chicago yeah and you're west coast how did that work uh, you know I just I, I think they thought I was a little crazy <laughs> I mean again like I'd walk out there and I'd like you know I'd do anything on the team and I think they were just sort of like this guy's pretty entertaining I mean if if anything if anything we're going to rush this guy purely for the entertainment factor of the whole thing mm -hmm. um you know, and if he makes it great, and if he doesn't make it, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll see. We've at but least I'll, had the entertainment. <laughs> but it, you know, it's, it's, I, it, it goes back to when I was talking, you know, like I wanted, I wanted that trifecta. Like mm -hmm. I didn't, 
I didn't want to be just a full-time student or a full-time athlete. I, I did think that in the right circumstances, as long as you can compartmentalize things the right way, um, and you have to learn to, like one of the things is you have to learn how to be balanced. That that's it's one of the tricks to life and it's what you want to teach. It's what you want to teach your kids. It's what you want to teach young adults is that you should want to do it all in life. But if you are going to do it all, you have to learn how to compartmentalize things and you know, know when you can do one thing and know when to stop and know when you have to do something else. And, um, you know, pledging fraternity, that was pretty tough back then. Um, I will tell you, so we, we, like one of my favorite memories is we would have, um, we'd have work duties, like, you know, during the, during the weekends or at night. And I remember it was one, it was one like Saturday and uh, I, I don't even know, it might, it might've been the off, it was the off season. It was, so we were having, we were having like weightlifting and some spring practice but um, I was just a wreck. I mean, I was just a disaster. And I remember they were like dividing up, they were signing people to, to do cleanup at different actives apartments. Mm -hmm. And they were about ready to assign me to somebody and Bradley came in and he said, no, 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 like, I'll take Casser. I go, I want him like to clean my, you want him to clean the football, you know, hall. So I went over there and Drudged over to car. They're living Carmichael all the time. And I was like, oh, I'm drudged over there. And I remember um, I go to his room and he takes um, his pillow off his bed and he puts a blanket on the floor. And he mm -hmm. says, he says, like, go to sleep. I'll come back here in about four hours. And um, as far as anyone's concerned, all you did was just clean up the all the football um, dorm rooms mm -hmm. in the last four hours. And it just blow you away blew me away like yeah. i mean you know i mean you know doug bradley the gentle giant he was just you know he was incredible and he like he saved it literally i was i probably would have gotten mono if if i hadn't had like that happened twice he did that twice for me uh -huh. and um i would have gotten really sick because you can't there's a certain point when you can't do it anymore you can't do it all yeah because yeah, your body's got to rest and you're so mm. right and and i was going to ask you you must have had a, a very solid foundation academically as well as as your family must have just preached and and pounded it in that you've got to have priorities because you know when we're or when we're coming out of high school we're the big fish in the little pond and the transition to now being little fish in the big pond at Vanderbilt it's hard to adjust if you don't have a solid foundation academically athletically uh, social wise, maturity wise. And that's why a lot of guys, um, whether they want it or not, absolutely need that year of red shirt mm -hmm. because it just allows them to get their feet under them to figure stuff out. And some guys never figure it out and they leave or they fail out. But for a lot of people, they take that year. Um, so that's, I guess, I want to talk a little bit about from that standpoint. I want to further your conversation about that balance because there's only so many hours in a day and you have to sleep at some point mm -hmm. you may fool yourself into thinking oh I'm, I'm good on two or three out well we all know that catches up yeah but at what point I guess my question is Brian at what point that first year maybe even the sophomore year did you find your footing did you find this I'm not just going to be surviving here but I'm not going to be able to, to move forward and thrive here you know, Bernard, I, I think the answer to that, it's a complicated question because everyone, I, the answer is this. I think everyone has to find their thing. Like they have to figure out eventually in life what's going to define you. We all, we're not like all a plastic mold and are, we're not all going to be exactly the same. We're not all going to be doctors. We're not all going to be lawyers. We're not all going to be, I don't know, government officials or politicians um people are good at different things and i think that you you know you have to start to get pretty comfortable you can't be all things to all people you're you're not going to you're not going to get a's in every single class okay like but the classes you should be getting a's in mm -hmm. i learned this early this is what i learned it's like if you if you strive for perfection um you're you're going to have a lot of hiccups along the way. I I think that, you know, the the enemy of perfect is is just good enough for whatever it is that old line. Um, 
you know, I, I think I learned more than anything that I couldn't do it all, but I had to start to get comfortable with the things that I was going to be really good at and were going to define me. And, and that was going to be good enough. That was going to be like, that's, that was going to be what made me happy in life and made me satisfied. And I wasn't going to sit and worry about everyone else. I wasn't going to sit and worry because all these people were better athletes than me or, you know, better players on the team or all these people were better students than me, or all these people were better looking and getting more girls than me on, you know, at fraternity parties. You, you start to just say to yourself, like, I'm pretty comfortable, like, putting out my best effort, being the best I can possibly be, and just kind of like, you know, accepting it. And when you do figure out what your lane is, just work your ass off to be really exceptional at that. And and I think that that's that's sort of the thing that I learned way back then that helped kind of you know get me kickstarted in my career to get me get me where I'm now because candidly I'm not the smartest guy in my firm I'm not you know the the you know the best public speaker in my firm I'm not the most wonderful conversationalist in the firm but I do enough things right and I figured out my lane that I can be a really good team player and I can contribute. The way I walked in and I was Chris Gaines' tackling dummy, I can I can understand what my role needs to be throughout my career and and find success and happiness. That's that's the key thing. That four minutes right there, you need to be in front of Coach Lee's team mm. sharing that right there, Brian. Mm. That that's the key. That that is such gold. And for you to find that or figure that out as a 19, 20 year old, whenever it started, the clarity was starting to become there. A lot of people never find that, mm -hmm. even at, at our age or older. But I think you're so spot on that the sooner you figure out those things in life, the more things come into focus and you can enjoy life and you can thrive instead of just trying to survive. But Gosh, that's just your experience is, is not common. Let me put it to you that way. And you probably have known this uh, just dealing with maybe guys in the fraternity because you had all levels, just like on the football team, mm. you have all levels of, of maturity, all levels of what I'll call knuckleheadedness. <laughs> and you probably still have some of that with some of the guys that you deal with. But Brian, but, what but, 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 but let me make one comment though about that is that yeah. – um, for your next question is that, yeah, you know, people are good. Like people are really, really good. A lot of times when you, when they're not like doing their best or they're not like happy or they're not like super like comfortable with what they've achieved, mm -hmm. it, it's because they're just insecure. It's because they're just not like thinking clearly about really that, mm -hmm. you know, no one's perfect at everything and that they are great at certain things. Yeah. But I don't yeah. tell you that like, what if you can help if you can help along the way people understand like hey be comfortable with who you are like be really you know satisfied all of a sudden they kind of take they take a step back mm -hmm. and they're they're a lot more comfortable with themselves they're a lot less insecure they're a lot more themselves they're not trying to prove something to yeah. to people along the way and you know i the reason i'm bringing this up is is like they're just happier they're happier and they're happier and they're more fun to be around and like when you find that, and I would just say most people are really close to that. You just kind of got to give them a little nudge sometimes to, to get them there. It's not like they're like, you know, they're lost and they're bad. It's just that when they're trying a little too hard or they haven't found that sweet spot yet, mm -hmm. um, they just need a little help getting there. You know, sometimes confidence is not there. Sometimes too much pride mm -hmm. is there. But you're, you're so right. And, and enough of our TED Talk for now. We're going to get back yeah. to Vanderbilt. <laughs> yeah. no, Brian, there's beautiful words. And thank you for sharing that philosophies and how you dealt with that. Which, which gave you greater joy? And there may not be a great answer to this mm -hmm. from you. Being in the fraternity, playing football, or just being a student athlete at Vanderbilt? I, I would tell you that just going and trying, trying to be a football player at Vanderbilt mm -hmm. was the, the, the best thing I did in college. 
by far. For, by further, far. That, further that thought, why, why was that the best thing that you did? Um, it was the hardest thing mm -hmm. I did. It was the lowest chance of success of anything I was going to do. Mm -hmm. um, it was the most out of my comfort zone walking into a situation where I was going to be the last guy on the team, not one of the first guys on the team. Mm -hmm. And knowing that I, most importantly, I really wanted it. I loved competing. I loved sports. Like there was nothing I liked better than high school football. I would start thinking about game day in high school. Like it would be a Friday night game. I would start thinking about it on Wednesday when I, when I woke up and you, I you had that tunnel vision for a while. I, I could barely concentrate in my classes. I would be so amped up for the game mm -hmm. and I'd have to like do my breathing exercises because I would just, I'd probably start hyperventilating, you know, <laughs> around Friday, a few hours yeah. before the game, yeah. but I love competing. And I just, and then Bernard, I don't, I don't think I'd be as happy. I don't think I'd be as content if I had never tried it mm -hmm. in my life. I really wanted to try it. it. It would have been one of those maybe voids or what ifs in your life, but but you didn't. You went out, you played for a couple of years, you 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 got the hell knocked out of you every single day, but you gave it your all. And from those experiences, and this is one of the beautiful things about team sports or really any sports where there's competition, is there's so many life lessons, and you've already shared so many so far, Brian, but as we get older and we see our children come up and they're, they're experiencing a lot of the things that we did, were you able to share some of those lessons with the boys? I don't know what sports or endeavors that they were in, but were there things that you were able to reflect back on during your Vanderbilt years that you were able to share, not, not just with, with your sons, but maybe with your team uh, at work or other people in your life? Yeah. You know, um, I would say, you know, let, let's just take my two sons, for example. You know, my older son, um, he really wanted to play baseball. That was his that was his thing. Mm -hmm. And um, he started slow. Like he wasn't, you know, a fabulous baseball player earlier in his career. He, he would tell you that himself. Mm -hmm. But man, he worked so hard at it. And I don't know, I don't know, like, I don't know if I ever really like told him it i just sort of felt like by just saying to him like hey keep going just i'd say just keep going don't don't worry mm -hmm. about if you're the best person on the team or the worst person on the team just keep going mm -hmm. and he wound up being so good in high school like mm -hmm. i mean from a guy who was like at the bottom of like the little league you know he was in right field picking daisies his first couple of years mm -hmm. to being you know one of the one of the star players on a team that won the northern california championship wow. in our area like one of the you know one of the, his teammates is um he's in triple a right now for the phillies mm -hmm. um but it was a in, it, I, what i if he had been like a natural athlete and just cruised yeah. all the way through i don't think i would even be as like happy as i was to see him you know sort of like the way i did i never stopped working never stopped trying yeah. and to watch him to watch him do that and, you know, my other son just, you know, he, he started a little bit faster at the whole thing, but he never, like he played football too. Mm -hmm. So he played in high school. And the thing that defined him more than anything was less about the personal improvement, but for him, like what, what a leader meant on the team. He was the captain. He was the starting center and linebacker on the football team. And he's not a big talker. He's a quiet guy. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, he'd, he'd look at the players, he'd look at them, they all respected him, and he expected them to behave in a certain way, and to, and to practice in a certain way, and hustle in a certain way, and conduct themselves in a certain way. And as a leader and a captain, I used to watch this from the sidelines. Again, I didn't say anything, but I just watch it. And I just took a lot of joy in watching, you know, him lead a group of people the right way. Um, so that they all kind of, you know, did it, did it properly, yeah. did it their way. Isn't that a cool feeling as a parent? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it was and, great. Yeah. Um, Brian, going back to, to those first two years at, at Vanderbilt, what did you, you, you like the least 
about being a walk on and on the team? Was there anything that you just didn't like or, or dreaded in addition to, or, or I'm not even talking about having to deal with Kelly at the equipment. Yeah. In the room. yeah. But yeah. are there any things that you wish may have been different or could have been different? You know, um, it's, it's interesting. And I thought about this question quite a bit. I probably would have played longer. I probably would have played all four years mm -hmm. if I had felt that the feedback mechanism was a little bit more mm -hmm. in sync. Mm -hmm. Like I, I did what I needed to do and I gave my all in practice in the weight room, Brad Bates, you know, the two of like, I was in there all the time. Oh, you him. were cut from his cloth. That's yeah. for sure. And um, I, you know, I would have loved, and look, Watson had a lot of things on his plate. Okay. Yeah. When you're the last guy on the team, I'm not high on his list of priorities. Okay. Mm -hmm. But somebody was giving, you know, gains really good reps every mm -hmm. practice. Mm -hmm. Somebody was working out longer in the weight room than other people. Mm -hmm. I would have, I would have loved, and and I, I will say this, I've taken this the rest of my career, is mm -hmm. that I always kind of look and see, okay, let's not just focus on the stars. Let's yeah. make sure we like, I want to see what the, what everyone in the organization is doing. Cause we're all like, you know, we all put our pants on the same way every day. We're all human. And um, the, I think that's the only thing I was ever a little bummed about is that not that I wanted recognition, but I wanted somebody to say, you know, Brian, look, just understand, we know you work you're working Chris Gaines super hard out there. We know you're spending more time in the weight room than anybody. It's acknowledged. It's recognized. Don't give up. You will get time. Brian, was there a coach assigned to the walk-ons as a whole? Or, or there not there wasn't. There wasn't. That was part of the problem. We had our yeah. position coats. We had Holiday, you know, and I, I would say that Brad Bates was probably my sponsor. I mean, you know, because I would work out so much in them. Yeah. And, you know, candidly, you know, Brad, remember Brad, you know, he migrated his role to being academic advisor yeah. eventually, which was very important because, you know, he and I used to talk about how hard it is to balance scholastic and, and, acad and the, the, and the sports. And we would talk about ways to strategies in order to do it all. Mm -hmm. And he was very focused on these very smart guy who was more than just a weight coach. You know, it was after our time that they really instituted a much more formal uh, tutoring program and mm -hmm. an academic center within Magugan. We really just missed out on, on the formal uh, settings that they clearly they've got some awesome things in place now, mm -hmm. but Brian, you, with Watson coming in in the fall of 86, you know, we only won nine games in those four years. We had mm -hmm. book in one in 10 seasons. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's not surprising that a lot of the, the walk-ons were largely not acknowledged in one way or, or another. Mm -hmm. What, I guess you, you, maybe you've already addressed that. Was that with you excelling, my term, excelling in the fraternity, did that allow your transition a little easier away from football because you had another built in? Absolutely. Uh, uh, not, I, I, we'll call them family, you know, brothers. Mm -hmm. uh, is that what was part of that? Was it hard for you to give up football? Was it a, a tough decision that you really struggled with? Yeah, it was a, it was a monumentally, I don't quit at anything. I yeah. never quit, never quit. I mean, this was like the only time in my life that I ever felt like a quitter and I didn't want to feel that way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I mean, I was pretty run down. Like I, you know, I was, I was grasping. And so I'm not even, you know, it's funny. I'm not even sure. Like the moment I quit, I think just one day I was just sort of like, I think I'm done. I think I'm just like done. Well, and, you know, did you have a conversation with, with coach Brown or any of the coaches about that decision? Yeah. I, I talked to him about it. And, um, and they were just, you know, they were super supportive and like, you know, but I think that I think the hard thing is, is like, they can't make promises. You yeah. know, that's just, I mean, you know, if they were, they're going to try to keep me out there, what are they going to say? Like, Hey, if you keep going, we're going to get you field time. Cause they can't promise that. That's right. You know, I mean, it's just not, it's just not realistic. And I respect that. I respect the honesty of it, but um, 
here's how the conversation should go. Like if I'm if I'm Watson, mm-hmm. and I know this because I'm now you know in business, I have to have these conversations inside of my companies. Oh sure, sure. Um, it's like, look, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I'm going to promise you a bunch of things if mm-hmm. you stay. Um, I'm not going to, you know, tell you you're great, or I'm not going to artificially pump you up and give you a bunch of props right now. I'm going to tell you that, you know, your, your hard work does not go unnoticed, that the things you do are very important to us, even if they're not on the field on game day. Mm-hmm. And um, if you need to know that you're going to be on the field for a game day, you know, at some point here consistently down the road, I won't promise you that. And I'm going to tell you, go figure out what you want to do in life. Yeah. But if you can be comfortable knowing that you are playing a huge role on this team in your way and contributing and that it's very appreciated and very respected, there is nothing I would like more for you just to keep going and just to fight it out mm-hmm. and, and know that this is the right, this is the right place for you. This is your family, stick yeah. it out and do it. And that would have been the right conversation to have. Again, I, I can't, but I will tell you this. If there's somebody I want to keep mm-hmm. at my companies, I have that conversation with them. Oh, and sure. I tell yeah. them how important they are. Yeah. Now, th- I mean, to be honest with you, I, I mean, I might've sucked so badly that like, it wasn't even like, if someone doesn't, shouldn't be on the team, don't have that conversation with them. No, but you should have the conversation that says, look, you're not material for SEC play. Yeah. But you didn't have that conversation. You played your two years. You transitioned. You you retired, we'll call it, from yeah. team sports. But when you when you left football and remained with fraternity life, yeah. did you have a transition period where you have all this time now that you normally didn't or did fraternity life fill all of that for you? Well, I, I decided to become rush chairman, like by the time I was there. So, <laughs> okay, so, sure. <laughs> my, so my schedule got pretty full at that yeah, point. I was going to say. I, I, I changed from going to practice every day to going to bars every single night of the week, seven nights a week. So I'm not sure it was the greatest judgment call in world's history, but it did keep me busy. But um, I, I, do, I do think that um, like the fact that there were teammates of mine who were also in the fraternity it was a very natural 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 transition Mm -hmm. like i felt great about like doing that i mean i do think like leaving leaving that level of activity it you know this is a tough thing bernard eventually everyone's sports career ends like you you can't play professional sports when you're 55 unless you're tom brady maybe he might he might do it mother nature is undefeated yeah or or mother time i guess that's just that's right so some people retire like I did at age 20 or 21. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Other people retire at age 43, but they all retire eventually. And there's a shock to the system when when something you're used to every day, like yeah. that level of intensity yeah. and physical exertion every single day, mm-hmm. when you walk away from that, there's kind of a mourning period for for oh, everyone 100%, that goes through that. 100 percent Absolutely. Some some guys who've been on this show. Talk about feeling lost. Yeah. They, they feel like the, a part of their existence, a part of who they are, mm-hmm. it's been yanked out from under them if they're not mentally ready. You mm-hmm. know, some guys get hurt to the extent where they have to retire. Some guys just graduate. A lot of us just graduate. Some go and play in the pros. Very few, but some go and play in the pros. We all have our own journey, but you're so right, Brian. At some point, those cleats have got to be hung up and it's time to pivot to whatever the next chapters in life. And if you can control that, like you did, mm-hmm. you can control that. I think that it changes your outlook, just like mm-hmm. yours seems to be extremely healthy the way that you dealt with it back then and, and ever since. Yeah, that's, but, that's, that's, a, that's a, and it, it, but it's, you know, like you said, is that if it's too much of a shock to your system when it happens, mm-hmm. that's when things get tough. Because you do have to move on, you know, like nobody, I mean, I don't think any of us, like, I remember for the first few years of my career, sitting at a desk for 10 or 12 hours a day, like never leaving my desk. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this going from existence that you and I and other folks had, we were on a football field, we were playing sports. I mean, this is like, we play a game for a living. 
this yeah, is yeah. to to sit at a desk that's hard for people to adjust to well it's reality it then becomes the new reality mm-hmm. you know we've seen way too many professional athletes and i know we're getting a little off topic but a horrible example is seeing willie mays late in his career, just not physically able to do what he used to do. Mm-hmm. Joe Namath hobbling around playing for the Rams. There's countless examples. They just want one more shot at glory or one, mm-hmm. you know, feel that one more time. But Brian, with your natural progression from football into fraternity, and then ultimately let's, let's talk about your going into your senior year and you're starting to look at not just these four or five years. I'm not sure what year you graduated, but you're now looking at the next 40 or 50 that we're sitting in now, Mm. when did you have some clarity about where you were headed post-graduation or did you at that time? Yeah, I think probably when I was 32 is when I started (laughs) to have clarity. You know, and to be be clear, that's not the year you graduated. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) That's right. There was, there was a journey there. Look, I will tell you this. And one of the things I'll tell anybody is I don't mind people spending their twenties figuring out what, what life's about and trying a whole bunch of things. I went into consulting. I got a great job offer from this firm called Anderson Consulting, which became Accenture. Mm-hmm. And it was sort of a no brainer you know, offer. I don't, I don't know if you know this. The, the other thing I was going to do was become a sportscaster. I was working for CBS. So when I stopped playing, I started working for you know, different local stations. I'd worked for the radio station on, on the campus. Mm-hmm. And then I got a job on the weekends running the teleprompter for the news and the sports department at CBS in Nashville. No, and I didn't so, know that. Wow. Yeah, so Very I cool. was ready to go down the road. And I worked at C-SPAN for the summer in, in D.C. doing um, broadcast journalism. Mm-hmm. So I was all set to do that. And then um, I started looking for jobs in broadcast journalism. And I think my only job was in a small town, like really, really south in Tennessee. And it was for, I think it was like $7,000 a year. And Accenture offered me like three or four times that much. And I was just sort of like, well, I think that's the end of my broadcast career. So mm-hmm. I went into that, but I, and I did a whole bunch of stuff. I did consulting. I went back to business school. I, um, I, I went into investment banking just to kind of, you know, see, see what getting my ass kicked again was mm-hmm. going to be like, just like in football. And I did that for a bunch of years. And, you know, next thing you know, I kind of about 31, 32 years old, I started kind of found my lane but the only way I found my lane was like trying a bunch of things in the 20 in my 20s that's what you're what you said earlier that's what your 20s are about yeah it's, that's why you you see kids take I guess they call it a gap year or they take their their first jobs but it may not be their last jobs a bit probably quite often that they they switch around because how do you know with your first job coming out of school that that's what you want to do for the for your career Mm-hmm. Very few, very few know that, but um, that's, and, and Brian, we're getting close, closer toward the end of our, our conversation. Mm-hmm. It's been very enlightening, but it's sticking to the Vanderbilt theme, I guess one of the things I always like to ask, at some point, did you ever, post-graduation, ever get mad at your experience or upset at your experience in school thinking, I wish I would have done some things a little differently. I should have networked. I should have played more work, whatever it is. What were those things that kind of maybe you've wrestled with in your head and now hopefully come to terms with from your experience at Vanderbilt? Yeah, I would say that um, the only unsettling thing I ever had was how I ended my was how I ended my career in football at, at Vanderbilt. Mm-hmm. It was, it was very unceremonious. It, um, you know, it, it did feel like for the only time, one of the only times in my entire life, I felt like a quitter. And mm-hmm. I didn't like that. I didn't like that about myself. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I would tell you, I mean, I think I've told you this from the very beginning, like, mm-hmm. like my experience on the football team, like defined me, it defined the rest of my life. The, the lessons I learned, and this is someone who was just a scrub, okay? But just the experience I have has has set me up really so well to do everything I wanted to do the rest of my life and career, both personally and professionally. Mm-hmm. Um, like it is, it was a defining experience in my life. And that's mm-hmm. saying something for somebody who did not see the field. Um, but I will say that 
I don't consider myself a quitter. Mm-hmm. And I and I would say like, you know, you think about like in high school, like I never quit anything, you know, I, I made it through school, made it through all my, my graduate school, made it through all my jobs. I don't think I've ever quit a job. Like, mm-hmm. I always wonder like, how did I reach the point where I quit football? I'm like, what, like, what happened? Like, did I wake up on the wrong side of the bed one day and just like, you know? Well, well Brian, maybe you didn't, maybe you didn't quit. Maybe you just got to the point of completion or maybe you got to the point Maybe you accomplished what you wanted to accomplish. And maybe I'm wrong, yeah. but I don't think stopping something that you're doing or quitting what you're doing can be a, necessarily always a bad thing because it certainly freed up your abilities and your time to explore other things that maybe led to more networking, maybe led to a little better grades because you had time. I, I don't know. I'm just throwing things out there. But it doesn't sound like that it impeded you. It sounded like that it created these lessons that you're, you've been sharing so beautifully with us tonight. Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, if I hadn't if I hadn't stopped playing football, I definitely wouldn't have had the grades I had my junior and senior year. Mm-hmm. And my grades my junior and senior year, candidly, are what helped get me into business school three years later. Oh, sure. You know, to be able sure. to get into, you know, to Wharton at that point in time, which was what I needed to do to go, you know, get a job on Wall Street after that. Like, yeah. you know, you're exactly right. Like, everything has a time and a place. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have a little bit of regret in your life, you probably haven't lived enough. You know, oh, you just haven't like, you know. Bingo. Bingo. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you just fly through life and there's no hiccups, what are you doing? Yeah. That's exactly right. That's, I mean, it, adversity is only good sometimes, you know, yeah. muster up and get through it. Well, you know, it, it, it teaches us so much. It helps mm-hmm. us to mature. It helps us to, to become just a little bit wiser mm-hmm. about things in life. Because if you don't have adversity in your life, are you living? Are you, are you, are you experiencing life? And I'm not wishing ill on anyone, of course. Yeah. I'm just saying we all have that ups and downs that, that get mm-hmm. us through life. But I, but I'll tell you this, Bernard. Um, you know, when you play for Vanderbilt, I mean, it's it's tricky. You're in the SEC. It is highly competitive. We understand how tough it is for a school like Vanderbilt with the academic standards we have at the school, mm-hmm. for Vanderbilt to consistently be at the top of the SEC and consistently win. We all understand that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What I would tell anybody, I would tell coach, I would tell the players this. Now and for the past, you know, 30, 40 years, mm-hmm. playing football at Vanderbilt is such a like unique and wonderful experience. Like mm-hmm. to be able to play at that level of division one football in the SEC and to be able to get the education you get to get, get at Vanderbilt and uh, to be able to play with people of the quality on that team that consistently recruited year after year into this program, mm-hmm. like I wouldn't trade that for the world. You could, I mean, sure, you know, some teams are, you know, 10 and one every year, but man, that experience is, uh, you know, I, I I hope coach can continue to recruit like incredible, not just players, but human beings to this program. And, you know, that they appreciate what they're getting by coming to Vanderbilt to play football. I think that culture has been developed and is developing right now with coach lee and the staff and what they're putting together that's absolutely true brian i could i could talk with you for the next three hours my friend but i want to be respectful of your time i want to thank you for the just candidly beautiful words sharing your experiences i think it's it's valuable whether you're the star of the team the walk on on the team or in between to learn the oral history of our program and what makes it what it is. Because without stories like yours, without stories like all the guests who've been on here, you know, it's it just, it's not worth it unless we share them. So thank you, bud, for for candidly sharing tonight. I really hey, appreciate it. You know, Bernard, thank you for the time. Thank you for doing this. This is so important for the Vanderbilt football community. Thank you for doing this. Um, thank you for, thank you to Doug Bradley and Steve Kasanovich for not just recruiting me to the Simakai house, but actually letting me sleep during work duty and not Amen. so I wouldn't get sick. And I would just leave with you is long live the walk-on. May there be incredible walk-ons 
throughout yeah. through the history of Vanderbilt football. Absolutely, 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 guys. I couldn't say it any any better than Brian has this evening. Uh, I've got more guests. We're going to take a two week break. I'm going to do a little travels. We'll be back in July. But please keep coming back to our Facebook group. There's stuff that gets put in there every single day, including our upcoming UNLV trip to Vegas. We've got more stuff we're planning, but I hope you guys are having a successful summer. Be safe out there. Go visit Nashville. Support our team. Anchor down.